Good evening. I'm Isabella with the Engagement Department at the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome to this evening's virtual conversation celebrating the exhibition, Andre Cortez, Postcards from Paris. We're so glad to have you all joining us virtually. And while we wish that we could welcome you in person, we hope that this digital format can offer a chance to stay connected to the Art Institute from home. We'll begin with a brief review of some of the features we'll be using today. This program will be shared in presentation mode, so we have turned off video and microphones for attendees. For optimal viewing, please select full screen mode under view options in the top right corner of your screen. Throughout the presentation, you're invited to share questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we look forward to answering some of those at the end of the presentation. Closed captions are also available and can be turned on via the controls at the bottom of the screen as well. If you encounter any technical difficulties during today's program, again, please let us know in the Q&A and we'll do our best to assist you. This program is being recorded, so if you'd like to revisit in the future, you'll be welcome to do so. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. First is Liz Siegel, Curator of Photography and Media and the curator of this wonderful exhibition. With a special focus on photography before 1970, her work examines the practices, reception, and material histories of photography. You may have seen one of her many, many museum exhibitions, which have included photography and folk art, looking for America in the 1930s, Alfred Stieglitz in the 19th century, and playing with pictures, the art of Victorian photo collage. She received her BA from Yale and her PhD from the University of Chicago. Grace Deveni, who is the David C. and Sarah Jean Ruttenberg Associate Curator of Photography and, Photography and Media. Prior to joining the museum, she was the Associate Curator of Prospect, a New Orleans-based triennial. She's also a familiar face to the museum, having worked as a researcher on the Art Institute Photography and Media exhibitions from 2011 to 2013, before spending five years in curatorial roles at the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago. Grace is joined in conversation by artists Felipe Baeza and Derek Woods Morrow. Felipe is a visual artist who lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Baeza's practice is equal parts confrontation of violent pasts and a tribute to people whose sense of personhood is constantly litigated and defined by those in power. His fugitive bodies created over densely layered paintings appear in different states of becoming and at times are even abstracted to the point of invisibility. Derek Woods Morrow is an artist who centers process-oriented collaborative projects with queer Black folks across a variety of media. Woods Morrow is a member of the Chicago-based collective Concerned Black Image Makers and serves on the board of directors at the Fire Island Artist Residency. His work has been written about in the New York Times, W Magazine, Art Forum, Artnet, and the Chicago Tribune, among many others. I want to thank you all for being here. And Liz, I will let you begin tonight's conversation. Uh, I am so excited to be here tonight with my new colleague, Grace, and the artists, Felipe Baeza and Derek Woods Morrow to see how art made nearly 100 years ago can encourage us to reflect on our own times. So what I wanna do tonight is to look closely at one theme that comes up in the work by Andre Kertej that's in the current exhibition, and one that is shared in the works of the artists we're speaking with tonight as well, and that is intimacy. And this term seems increasingly relevant these days as we've all acutely felt the need for connection and communication, two of the corollary components of intimacy these past few years. So to quickly summarize the exhibition, it looks at a focused period in the life and career of Andre Kertes, 1925 to 1928, the first years he spent in Paris, having left his native Hungary, years of remarkable experimentation and growth. This was a period in his life in which he had great social and artistic freedom, met and learned from a wide range of artists of all types, and produced most of his photographs as precise small-scaled prints on carte postale or postcard paper, such as this one of his well-known satiric dancer. So, 
I have been thinking about intimacy in terms of this work in a number of ways, and I thought it would be helpful for our conversation if I outlined a few of them for you now. So first of all, I've been thinking of intimacy as a function of subject matter. That is, who and what is he taking pictures of? So for one, he's using photography to explore his newly adopted city. He takes his camera with him on walks, photographing the sights and the people he encounters. For another, he's often the only photographer among his group of painters, sculptors, dancers, and musicians. His camera becomes a passport to a circle of like-minded friends. He starts by photographing people he knows from Budapest and their Hungarian friends. And as his network expands, he starts taking pictures of them as well. Each photograph cements a connection between the subject and the photographer, demarcating his circle of friendship and artistic exchange. So second, I've been thinking of intimacy as a function of size and scale. So you all know the size of a postcard. And if you've seen this exhibition in person, you know you have to get up nice and close to see these works. But if you need reminding, I took this picture of Chez Mondrian with a common object, a dollar bill, to show you its scale. Many of them are even smaller. At the time, people viewing these prints would have had to have been in intimate proximity to the works holding them in their hands, keeping them in their pockets. Their size forces a particular relationship that is different from that of, say, history painting or even a standard exhibition-sized photograph today. Third, I want to consider intimacy as a function of circulation or where and how the prints were encountered. Kertej was away from his home and his family, and he often sent the photographs through the mail back to Hungary or to his brother in Argentina. He did so in part to show them new developments in his craft and in part to assure them that he was surviving and even thriving in his new home. He sent this deliberate, confident self-portrait with numerous references to both his old Hungarian life and his new Parisian one back to his family in Budapest. But he didn't address and mail them the way you might commonly think of sending a postcard, but sent them in envelopes, likely with a newsy letter such as this one he received from his brother, Yeno. He could also pass them around at the cafes in Montparnasse where he spent much of his free time. And who is on the receiving end of all of these pictures in the mail and at the table? It's friends and family. One thing I do want to note, however, is that intimacy is not a function of nostalgia here. Although we may now be nostalgic for these relics of the 1920s, remember sending postcards in the mail uh, and, and find them endearingly quaint. At the time that Kertesz made them, they were absolutely a contemporary form of communication, akin in a more limited circulation and spontaneity to photo sharing sites today. So this car postal print sent to his brother is the selfie of his day. Intimacy doesn't have to take a particular material form. So I want to hand this over to Grace, Felipe, and Derek for what I know will be an engaging and illuminating conversation on these themes. And I hope we can keep this earlier moment in mind for what it can teach us about our own attempts at communication and building community. So Grace, take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Liz. Um, before turning things over to the artists, um, I just wanted to, um, to give a little bit of an introduction to this conversation, um, which Liz and I intended to bring together um, artists who could shed light on some of the ways intimacy presents itself in contemporary art practice today. To that end, um, I wanted to thank Felipe Baeza and Derek Woodsmore for joining us um, and giving us a window into their respective practices. Each of these artists thoughtfully engages with the three points Liz described, subject, scale, and circulation, as well as other tactics to cultivate closeness and conversation with the subjects of their work and the audiences that encounter that work. They engage with both popular culture and the past, but like Cortez in his day, they do so in ways that aren't nostalgic, but instead encourage us to think about the past in relation to the present and future. 
Um, while each artist will reveal more about their work through our conversation, I wanted to begin with a brief introduction to each of their practice and suggest some of the ways their work relates to the themes that Liz articulated. So Felipe's engagement with invisibility and fragmentation encourage close looking on the part of the viewer to discern the presence of the body within the work and oftentimes the body's relationship to land and history. The physical layers of material embedded in his work not only invite close looking and a desire to experience them through touch, but they also present complex notions of identity. The collage on screen here, for example, brings together images of pre-Columbian sculpture taken from a book published by the Mexican Secretary of Education, brings us together with fragments of bodies taken from contemporary sources such as fashion and adult magazines. In doing so, the collages collapse the boundaries between time and place, and like her touches postcards, um, which as Liz described, were a way to synthesize and connect his new life in Paris to his past in Hungary. Baez's works also explore ways of articulating place and position in the world and um, ways to define oneself and one's communities across borders. Um, now turning to Derek's work, as a photographer and a maker of film, sculpture, and performance, Derek often works with others, exploring the multitude of ways to be a part of what he has called a Black queer Southern diaspora. Uh, photographs such as the one on screen now speak to Derek's ability to represent closeness and the nuances of touch. Here, there's so much implied in this image, um, but at the same time, aspects of the subjects of this picture are concealed from view. Um, when I look at this picture, I'm really struck too by the ways the legs of the two people in this picture overlap in a way that makes it hard to distinguish where one person end, ends and the other begins, but it also encapsulates a kind of warmth and closeness associated with the most positive connotations of intimacy. Um, in addition to Derek's ability to cultivate and frame moments like this for the camera, his work thoughtfully connects with historic and contemporary forms of communication through his use of archives, mail, social media, and his ongoing pursuit of knowledge and connection about the intersections of race, gender, and sexuality. For each artist, intimacy connects to various um, subject matters in their works, as well as questions of scale and circulation. Um, and they also negotiate complex contemporary notions of identi identity, privacy, and care. Um, and now I'd like to invite each of them to say a bit in their own words about their practice, um, and we'll follow that with the conversation. So starting with you, Felipe, could you tell us a little bit more about your practice and what intimacy means as a part of your work? Yeah, well, first I wanna say, well, hi everyone and thank you, Grace, for the invitation and to be in conversation with Derek and, and Liz. Um, I'm quite happy to be connected to this talk in many ways, also to be at a talk at, at this institution located in a city where, where I grew up. I'm currently in Brooklyn, that's where I'm based. Um, and even if it's in a virtual space, I'm happy to be in, in this conversation. Um, yeah, a bit of what you already said about my work, Grace. Uh, my work and practice takes uh, an interest in science fiction, migration and queerness. And, and as you've seen through the first slides, also through anthropology, but also through the use of collage and printmaking, my work explores ideas of the fugitive body. Um, always on the run, the fugitive body lives in concealment, but also lives without status, or as uh, Fred Moten would describe it, is to live without credit. Um, and I am to, I aim to reconstruct new imaginaries of neither here nor there, allowing the fugitive body to, to make use of imagination as a, as a tool for liberation to transcend circumstances. And I hope you know my work is in many ways concerned with, with the body as, as praxis, as space, but also uh, the possibilities of making subjects contain their own complexities and agency. And I aim to create a new meaning by working together with different creative languages and in doing so telling alternative histories and alternative modes of inhabiting time and space. Um, as we see in the images we've been looking at in my most recent practice, um, I've been in interested in investigating how memory migration and displacement work to create a state of hybridity and a fugitive uh, state of suspension and primarily working on paper um, and incorporating different techniques via collage and decollage. I aim to render visible those bodies and histories that have been either render uh, invisible or have disappeared or have been erased. And in making 
invisible, visible, and vice versa, I am to challenge the notions I keep people in the margins. And I use this strategy to imagine structures and possibilities um, um, for self-emancipation of the hybrid fugitive body that lives in and is persistently susceptible to hostile conditions. The possibility for, for, self, for self-emancipation is forged by the necessity to survive and thrive. So here I'm thinking about Hertesh, right, and his time in Paris and how he found this sort of tool through photography as a way to maintain those ties back home, but also build new ties in, in his new land, which is Paris. Um, and through creating those new forms and structures, they tend to produce liminal spaces of belonging. Um, and I think for that it, intimacy, as we spoke in past conversations, has a lot to do with that I see intimacy also as a mode of protection and as a mode of, of thinking about invisibility as a, as a mode of, of, of thriving. Thank you for that. Um, Derek, would you like to give us an introduction to your work? No, really? Absolutely. Um, please excuse me, I'm sort of in the middle of a bout of bronchitis, so I am uh, trying to keep it together for this talk. Uh, I want to say thank you, Liz, Grace, and Felipe also, of course. Thank you to the Art Institute of Chicago. Excited to be here um, <clears throat> and talk about my work, um, which is constantly being uh, in a space or in a place of negotiating the way desire operates um, consistently um, and thinking about intimacy as a form of language um, and aesthetics as a form of visual language. Uh, I'm sort of navigating my life and the hopes for my life in some type of communal way. Um, and I think by taking that route, I'm trying to say that I am well aware I can't do it by myself. I'm also well aware that I learn best in community from other people. And for a long time, I didn't navigate the world that way. Um, I was very goal oriented. And I think I still have ambitions, of course, but there is a way in which I would make product oriented work and I would navigate work as trying to finish a photo shoot. And now, oftentimes when I'm using photography, it's sort of always there. The Polaroid camera comes with me, my digital camera, my film cameras come with me, and I'm actually just in a space of cultivation with other people. And so the process of building community or the process of being in dialogue or having questions about decoloniality as it ranges around sex or racial mobility is just what's happening in the room or on the beach um, when I'm with people. And then the photographs fall off of that experience of being together. And then the sculptures come out of the experiences of dialogues up late with other Black folks and letting that actually be the way in which I navigate my practice. And so sometimes I'm navigating trauma and sometimes I'm navigating joy. And other moments I'm trying to navigate rest or labor. But what is very true for me is that it's very constant, um, a constant introspection, a constant wondering of how I exist in the world, and very much aware that I'm like a 6'4", 300 pound uh, Black queer person in the universe who's very sex positive and is often flippant in the way I discuss sexual education or um, sexual proclivities, uh, just because I think we need that in the world. Um, and so sometimes like in my, in my performances, I'm trying to uh, escape to safety. And other times, like in this film, the uh, much handled things are always soft. It was really important for me after Moonlight came out to have a film that documented uh, the AIDS crisis, uh, how it affected Chicago. Uh, lots of things have been done about New York and San Francisco, but also that I wanted to talk about Black sex, like that Black men touch each other um, and that they do engage sexually in public and elsewhere and that it, it needed to have a scenes within the film that engage with sex not just sexuality or identity um, politics and I think there's a certain type of intimacy that I'm asking for the world to know me and I think that's give me the space to to be um to be able to talk about these things <laughs> uh, without come, you know, without attacking me for something that I am living and a part of. Um, uh, I guess I can stop there. I have so many, I can't wait to talk with y'all. So yeah, we, let's all. That's me. Let's all get together and talk. Thank you so much for those introductions. Um, something that you said um, towards the end, um, 
end of your introduction, Derek, was this piece around relationship between intimacy and knowledge. Um, and I think that's something that I'm really struck by with both of your practices and also as they relate to Kirtej is the ways that um, artistic process becomes a form of learning about self, learning about place um, and a form of knowledge production. Um, so I'm wondering um, if each of you, um, you know, if that's something that you think about that there's this kind of connection between intimacy and knowledge and the, the ways that you're making your work. Yeah, well, I guess what I could say and what I said instead of in my introduction was thinking about intimacy and how it works in various ways, right? And thinking the sort of the acrobatics of intimacy. And by that, I mean the, the acrobatics of like, that happen when sort of the landscape or community is not there. Um, and what, you say what more needs about to that? happen. Um, yeah, well, I guess I could just, you know, through my lived experience, but also to Kirtesh and what I have known in the past few days and, and kind of the information that obviously he was an immigrant himself moving from Hungary to Paris, right? And, and he ended up sort of like uh, finding this sort of tool through photography, but also through the postcard size work to, to build a new network of people, but also to maintain a network of people that he had left behind uh, as a mode of survival, right? So I think that's sort of like a, a mode of intimacy that I think Liz spoke about that, that at that time it was contemporary technology in many ways um, to share information. Um, and those are the ways that I think about is like through my own journey of, of not being born in this country um, but also seen it through my family who migrated to Chicago in the late, uh, in, in the early nineties, seeing sort of their, their mode of survival was to, you know, when, you, when the landscape isn't there and the structure isn't there, you have to build it, right? So I think that's where imagination happens and community happens, right? I think we can see it in Chicago, there's such a strong uh, Mexican community, right? And then I think that was forged by the necessity of creating, creating that and, and as a mode of survival. Um, and in many ways, um, that obviously comes up in the work, as it's obviously my lived experience in many ways. And thinking of of of, of those modes of intimacy, um, uh, uh, of building sort of a, a landscape with community and a mm -hmm. collective community. Yeah, I like the way you talk about collective community and also the distance away from that community, because for so long, I also didn't want to go back to the South, which is where I was born and raised. And I, I saw the North as a place where I could find more mobility, but like all of the police violence, all of the things that have happened to my body that are by part negative have happened in the North. And in general, not the South where I grew up in the country with Confederate flags flying. So there's just interesting dissonance here and the, like a nuance required to understand how to dialogue and be in community with the South. And so it was a few years ago, maybe five, not a few, it's five to seven now, I started returning to the South and wanting to build connections with people in the South and figure out how they navigated it. Were you born and raised here? You know, did you just, did you migrate here? And you've only been here for two years. What is your experience like? And I think we talk about intersectionality a lot and that's inherently a process about intimacy or the correlation between intimate things, right? And so and throughout, throughout the practice, I'm oftentimes just trying to have uh, extended dialogues between objects and people or myself in an experience um, that connects to the South. I think I am, I'm inherently connected to the South because I was born there. You know, I, I, my, my understandings of how I navigate the universe oftentimes uh, have a lot of contemporary things that come into them. Uh, if it wasn't for like one of my recent partners, I wouldn't really see relationship and try to de de uh, decolonize uh, my relationship to other people in the way that I do. But I learned how to love as a child in the South. Hmm. Right? And I'm trying to like parse that out as an adult because I've gotten in many ways so far away from that in order just to survive in the body that I have. And the work I think is always sort of in negotiation with my survival um, and the nuances that I have to take on to survive and other people have to do. And understanding that our sort of languages may be different but that there is some communal joy in trying to like navigate that together maybe. I mean, I hope there's some communal joy. I mean, I hope it's not only trauma. 
I think, um, yes, to communal, communal joy and trauma and those things coexisting and coinciding. And I think the ability to share those things um, equally and openly is definitely a function of intimacy as I understand it too. Um, and something that, uh, something that comes up in one of the films you showed is still from um, Derek, the, the Roach is Coming. There's a moment um, where with your collaborator in that film, you talk about discomfort and you challenge him to think about the ways that discomfort is a productive mode of being and that it kind of um, encourages you to dig deeper, push forward. Um, and as we have this conversation, I'm sort of making this connection that in each of these practices, there's this, you know, kind of, um, searching for a sense of self in various places and moving through places um, and that, yeah, th th this kind of like practice or search for intimacy or creating work from the space also kind of attends a certain, um, a certain kind of discomfort. Um, and I'm wondering too, if, you know, Liz and your, um, you know, research into Cortez and the making of these postcards, if that's something that comes up as like something he's navigating being in this new city and, um, you know, making, making work, making friends, trying to find a way of being. Well, it's interesting. So I wrote down like all these words that you guys were saying in your um, presentation. So belonging, desire, language, communion and community, being known um, and survival. And um, and thinking about, uh, Grace, you sort of prompted me to think about, is this in relation to um, a place or to people. And, um, and so I see that certainly with Kertesz um, of like using the camera to understand a new place and to connect with people. And I'm hearing that actually from both Derek and Felipe. I don't know if I wonder if you wanna talk about that a little bit more. We don't have to, I mean, I talk too much. So Felipe, if you can go, you can. Uh, I don't know if we have to go in order though. <laughs> so like, no order, no order. order. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, what I could say, you know, in regards to collective healing, right? And 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 and, and in connection to the show is that, you know, I'm, I'm always actually like constantly questioning, like, what is it, um, what is made in like the space of confinement and enclosure, right? And I think, and thinking the possibilities that I think once one might see that space as a, as a space that it's not fruitful, but I think it's quite the opposite that in many ways that structure has been there and, and from, from, you know, um, has been there. Um, but I also think that as a collective, um, we have found beauty, imagination, possibility in those constraints, right? And I think I, I, maybe I'll put it just to my lived experience, you know, what is it, you know, part of my life I've, I've lived and documented um, in this country, right? And what is it to, to create a life worth living? And I saw that through my parents, right? To even have the imagination to, to believe that like moving to another place will be a better life, right? Where we now see that that's not the case. You know, once you arrive here as an immigrant, sort of your experience here mirrors what you left behind and probably your worst. Uh, but in that, in that situation, you have to build that structure, right? Um, so I think that's also what I guess that I'm thinking about the word in which, in which ways intimacy works with that. You know, I think, you know, I've spoken with Grace and Derek about this in our last conversation. And very much, I think, as intimacy, maybe, maybe visibility and visibility is not the right choice for me. But I think more of the ways we... Um, the ways we uh, announce ourselves, right? Um, that I'm that I'm thinking about uh, as intimacy. Like I think I'm thinking about the way one may be visible but only legible to some. Um, and I think that's the way that I, I think about about this word in many ways and, and how it how it functions in my practice in many ways. It makes me think of this text by uh, Mia Mingus called Access Intimacy, and it's. It's not, yeah, it's pretty short. I think people sh should be able to access it pretty easily, but it, it doesn't situate intimacy as something that um, 
can always be gained by someone else. Like there are some people who will be inherently more intimate with others because of certain type of even visual languages that they have or the type of like smell or taste or like the way in which you shared experiences together. And there's a way in which we always talk about like um, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And there are people within my community who like would wish harm on me for my sexuality, right? And I, the way I hold them in the sort of intimate realm is with care and hope and kindness, but I also have to protect myself in more than one way in the world that we exist in. And so I think, you know, when I'm thinking about intimacy, I'm thinking about my own form in relationship to other people, right? So when I walk into a party full of like black trans folks, knowing that cishet black men historically and statistically murder and destroy those bodies. When people have some type of animosity against me, I understand that it is my role as steward to have conversation, intimate nuanced conversations with those folks and be kind, right? Even though I haven't done anything. And I think when you realize you can cause harm without even having the intention to do so, I think you begin building an intimate relationship with yourself and just the world around you. Um, Cause you move with a different type of care in the world. Uh, and that's something I had to learn. I didn't, that, that's a language, maybe it's empathy that I did not have, um, or I guess I had, but not to the extent to which I'm trying to use it as maybe a skill to greater, better understand myself and like have intimate relationships with people who I may or may not know or want to know. And I think part of it is also allowing myself to trip into these relationships <laughs> and accidentally let them happen, like be happenstance. Um, but you can't be, you know, I don't want to say be, be naive, you know, like you do have to protect yourself. And I think there's a, there's a dance that we're doing both in my practice um, and in the way I sort of am entering the world that is supposed to acknowledge both the spaces I need to feel safe and the, and the things I'm willing to do because I actually believe, hopefully, um, empathy does matter. And we can build intimate, nuanced relationships with more than one type of person. I wanna say one more thing that as a kid, Felipe, like my notion of uh, the impossibility didn't exist. Like I, I was taught as a young black boy in the South that I could become an astronaut, superhero, laser gun, Goku, Dragon Ball Z character. And my, my grandmother, my mother who primarily raised me never told me I couldn't be those things. And some, some way along the way, I found out that there was some like uh, obstacle to that. And it turned out to be a lot of things, but like one of them was my race. And I, like it, I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. You know, like I, I, I couldn't even compute for a second. And then you begin overly analyzing, you overly compute. And so you spend the rest of the next 10 years trying to make sure you don't get killed. And now I just do flipping things. Like if I, you know, but just think. Um, Grace, sorry, I don't wanna no, talk over you. Maybe please. we're gonna say something similar. I was thinking, you know, Felipe said something about being legible to some leg or not legible to everybody or legible in different ways. And that makes me think about like audiences for your work and who do you wanna to talk to when and in what situation and didn't know if you could uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, I think in many ways, um, um, to be obviously transparent that I've been showing in commercial spaces, right? Um, but also been showing in institutions where to be transparent, I feel like the people that I would want to create work don't, don't inhabit those spaces, right? Um, to this day, my family has never been to a museum, right? Because we have never felt welcome to, in a museum. Um, and I think in many ways, that is also why I make this work I'm making, right? I also, I think it's, it's um, um, it's also for me to speak to a brighter audience, right? That I think the work functions very differently. And I think in person, when the work is confronted in person, you're allowed to, if you spend quite time with the work, the work starts to reveal itself. And I think that's what I meant where like the thing is visible, but not legible. Um, that as a viewer, you know, I'm very much interested in the viewer, slowing down the viewing process and, and as you, and as you um, encounter the work in person, the, the, the work starts to reveal parts of itself, right? Without fooling, fooling giving you everything. 
Um, and that's what I'm interested in the work. I think that's also works at, around intimacy, the intimacy between the work and the viewer and very much thinking about the visual and beyond the visual that happens with, with intimacy. And by that, I mean that I'm obviously interested in materiality and how materiality functions in the work kind of also as a trap in many ways um, that I also use a lot of embroidery in the work. And, and I've spoken about this in the way that the embroidery in many ways is responding to the body that's in front of it by either the environment that's, that's there or the actual breathing of the person. So in many ways, the work is acknowledging the presence of another body. Uh, yeah, I really, um, yeah, I just wanted to underscore that and, um, you know, say that something that I, as we, you know, have been talking about your work over the last year or so, just the ways that it kind of unfolds differently um, in person um, versus on screen. And, you know, I know our audience has seen some of it um, through the carousel, but there's there's thread, there's, there's glitter sometimes, there's things that really make the work come alive in conversation with the viewer in a way that I think kind of connects up with um, some of what Liz was describing in terms of the kind of tactility of Cortez's work and how it would have circulated in hand. And, um, you know, connecting this up with Derek, like I know that you have really kind of pushed some, some I don't want to say boundaries, but kind of you've challenged yourself to think through the ways people encounter your video, encounter your sculpture, and really have created these dynamic scenarios for the viewer's body um, in relation to your work. And I'm wondering if, um, yeah, I'm wondering how you think about that in terms of what you intend to convey to an audience or to specific audiences. And um, yeah, just thinking about the modes of display um, as they relate to these questions. I have to think about it a little bit as I talk through it, but <laughs> you know, um, I'm currently an educator uh, in Rhode Island at RISD and the artist statement is always about who's the work for. And I've tried to change the language around that and to have students consider who is the work meant to protect. And I think that helps me validate my decisions as a performance artist or someone who is really occupied with how people view images or how people come to understand the way things are being seen. Because I think you have to let go sometimes if you choose to show in a commercial space of how it can be viewed and how it will be written about, but you can also position your work in other spaces to be consumed a different way. And so one example would be the second film, Much Handled Things Are Always Soft, is shown in galleries in, um, uh, in many different places and was a part of, was commissioned by Visual Aids uh, for the day without art and showed in, um, I, I don't know, thousands of locations, it was great. Most of those locations were museums and at least the marquee sort of showings of it were in museums but there was this moment where um, and I sort of use the material of social media a lot in the work as the research and maybe the prospect for navigating some type of terrain less actually using grinder or scruff or instagram as like from a symbolic standpoint um, but I was asked to have the film be positioned in jacked and Jack is a social media app geared towards upwards of 3 million uh, black and brown queer folks uh, between here and Canada. And so having the film screen in the app had 40,000 people watching it at once. And then it meets the community who the film is about, right? When you're talking about the AIDS crisis, you're talking about redlining, you're talking about how Chicago's bureaucracy and bullshit created part of the turmoil you know, it made sense, right? And that gave me this sort of opportunity to be like, this is what I want from the work um, in this space. And it accomplished that. And in some ways I don't get what I want out of the work when it shows a gallery sometimes, or, but I, I try to see the work as porous and its ability to make it into other places. And I, I guess I keep calling it the work, but it's maybe just my life honestly, like I see my life as porous. And so but the opportunity to exist as an artist doesn't just come when I'm in the classroom or when I'm showing somewhere. It's like just in walking into a bar and accidentally meeting someone and that becomes material for the next thing that I make. My, I keep getting on the Peloton because 
I, I ruptured my Achilles and that's about all I can do right now is bike. And I keep, I keep journaling these Peloton experiences as I uh, pedal through these virtual worlds of like somewhere in Spain or somewhere in the so-and-so mountains. And I, I'm so not there, I'm here <laughs> <laughs> somehow. <laughs> But it, it it will come into the work somewhere. Yeah. Um, I think that's really interesting. And um, the idea that the things that you're seeing every day come into the work and your life and those two things being deeply intertwined feels very connected with the themes of the exhibition. And also, I think, connects up with some things we've talked about, Felipe, like when you were making um, work for uh, New Orleans, um, I remember us having a conversation about tree roots and like the kind of like ways that, you know, the kind of things you're seeing in nature as you walk around are informing the work. So does part of that feel resonant to you, that kind of like interweaving of, you know, daily experience as it makes its way into, into the, the paintings and, and the collages? Yeah, I'll speak to that. I think obviously m my practice and work has changed throughout the years. And, and actually I started through photography in many ways, um, then through printmaking and then now through this way of making that um, that is very much rooted in, in photography and in printmaking. And as you said, through that, I've been sort of archiving images and doing research across many things of interest. And, and for Prospect, you know, I wanted to, to um, to speak obviously to to a location that I've never been to, right? And how to how to speak to a location that I've never been to in a in a in a respectful way, right? Rather than romanticizing an idea of a place that actually I've never been to. Um, but in that doing the research of like, oh well, specific uh, trees came about. And these are these famous oak trees that in many ways are are older than than, than New Orleans itself, right? Um, and thinking about, you know, during that time, but also now the idea of monuments, right? And thinking of, of these living monuments that have lived so much history and that have survived, right? And that are very much rooted and still growing. And, and, and if you've never seen these trees, I would, would recommend you see them uh, and, and on, on, on looking them out on Google. And there's just these fantastic oak trees that are just kind of just in many ways aging and they're being upholded by by these poles and being supported by these poles. Uh, and I was responding that to my own work, you know, and thinking how is the body made material and also responding to, to, to that absence, right? That we're all here because of an absence. Um, and and it, it goes to a series of works that I was making uh, about sort of those bodies that have either perished through that sort of middle passage or through that sort of middle point of, of, of trying to arrive to a better life or, or another land and thinking that that those bodies are obviously still thriving in new forms and are still giving life to new forms there is so much to think about and talk about and i feel like the connections between these the your practice and how you articulate it are having so many exciting and unexpected resonances with the show. So I just want to thank you both so much for your willingness to, to join us um, to talk about practice across space and time. Um, yeah, I think that we are out of time. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Grace, for closing us out. And I wanted to thank you all so much for sharing this really rich conversation with us this evening. Um, and I'd like to thank our audience as well for joining us and submitting questions, even though we didn't have time for all of them tonight, we always appreciate your comments and feedback. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and have a chance to view Andre Cortez postcards from Paris on view through January 17th, 2022. For more information on upcoming virtual events, please visit us online at artic.edu and look for our monthly e-news in your inboxes. We look forward to seeing you again soon. And thank you all again to the group. <laughs>